Good morning, everyone. Suasdai. <laughs> it's truly an honor to stand before you all, stand before some of the leading movers and shakers in the world of American dance. I hope that by sharing my humble experience in this short time together, the voices that are too often ignored and unheard, the lives that never make it onto this stage, and that of so many others. Can further emerge, and like a golden drum rising and beating in the height of the sky, I hope that these voices and lives, voices of the past, present, and future, embodied by the singular movements of persons and peoples all over the world, can resound and shine on upon every surface of this earth. My name is Promsudan Auk. I am the son of Khmer refugees. My parents and some of my elder siblings survived the Khmer Rouge genocide, which saw the deaths of an entire third of Cambodia's population. They escaped to camps along the Thai border with limited food, violent conflict, and human trafficking, before finally resettling in the United States. I was born and raised in Long Beach, California. My formative years filled with the interracial tensions and gang warfare of a post-Los Angeles race riots community. I remember shooting marbles with my friends before the sound of a speeding car would suddenly stop. Young men armed with bats and sticks and knives running out to attack the boys nearby. I remember the uncertainty and shame of too many teenage girls dropping out of high school, pregnant, shunned, and sometimes abandoned. I remember not being able to say what I needed to say, to talk about life with the people who gave me life, because already old and trapped in the home of too many children, my parents never had the time or the money to learn English. And I, I on the other hand, like so many Khmer Americans of my generation, couldn't speak our mother tongue because it was not the language used in school, or the language used、uh, in the cartoons playing t- on television. In this world, this world of cyclical violence and poverty, of uneducation and miseducation. Of cultural rifts and generational trauma, it is easy to see how someone could slip through the cracks, to become the unseen, the invisible, the unheard. And in such a precarious world, it is easy to understand how someone like myself could long for more, yearn for a way out, hunger for an end to the pain and suffering. Dance. Was my escape. I began training in Khmer classical dance at the age of 16. My teacher Sopelin Chim Shapiro molded my young body amongst a sea of girls, giving me access to a tradition popularly understood as a female art form. Every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I found safety and refuge in the studio. The practice and perfection of each step and gesture a move towards the divine. The sonorous ringing of binbit music flowing from the stereo like a steady and powerful river. The smell of incense planted into fruit offerings filling the air. The laughter of my teacher and friends. The sadness of the world seemed to fade away in this new haven. Within a month of training. I became one of my teacher's most promising students, and due to an accident, a dancer was sewn in too tight into her costume. I made my debut at the World Festival of Sacred Music at Malibu's Lake Shrine. After the performance, a nun approached me, my costume ill-fitting, my makeup clumsy on my scarred face. 
She stood before me about two arms distance length and said, you are beautiful. Maybe that performance was coincidence, or maybe it was fate, but this was the beginning of a new world, a world where I seen and valued. I relished every opportunity to don a Khmer classical dance costume, to wear the gilded crowns and jewelry, the gold-threaded sequined and velvet, the silk skirts of gold brocade, costumes that catch light even in darkness. And as I performed beneath the Los Angeles skyscrapers during grand performances, and as I flew on a plane for the first time to perform with my teacher at the Oakland Museum, I got a fuller taste of the world's richness and magic. I fell in love with beauty and with life. I wanted to become an artist. Since then, many things have happened. I studied experimental filmmaking and photography at the San Francisco Art Institute. I danced alongside Maisa Duke and her Energia du Samba. I was threatened with physical attacks for querying Cambodia's most popular classical dance. Later, my mentor Oguri would push me to dance, to dance through our Chime Fellowship and through the pain of my father's passing. And years later still, I would quietly sell my gold necklace, the only heirloom I had from that man who gave me life, so that I could pay my dancers, the dancers of Bromsudan Alkin Natyarasa, Cambodia's first gay dance company. Throughout this journey of joys and tears, of sacrifices and uncertainties, I have come to better understand what home is. Home is witnessing the cycle of knowledge and love turn, watching my students ride on a plane for the first time, the excitement and wonder in their eyes as we make our way to Hong Kong or India. Home is hearing my student tell a group of German and Swiss students that being in the company has allowed him to see beauty, not just in dance, but in music and painting too. Home is the young stranger at a gay bar who tells me that he cried when I mentioned my dance company in my TED talk. Home is the place where I can serve humanity in my fullest capacity. There's this idea in comparative mythology, the hero always returns home. And for a Khmer American like myself, for all people who are born in, of, and between many different cultures and approaches, we know that we have many homes. We live in the eyes and hearts of others, in the traditions that we practice, shape, and create in our notions of personal and collective identity. And now that I stand before you here, home amongst people committed to the art of dance, transformed from the lone boy in class to the new face of Khmer dance, I'd like to offer a few reflections in the hopes that it may push us all to a higher place. First off, Having lived and worked in both Cambodia and the United States, practicing some, what some would call a traditional art, I know firsthand that the legacy of colonialism is alive and well. Because what I do is labeled as traditional, it's mistaken as static and lifeless. And because it is perceived this way, it is imagined as useless to life and society. It therefore fails to be valued in the programs presenters curate or by the grants and fellowships funders award. This has dire real world consequences, shaking the strength and confidence of individual artists, dissolving the threads that bind and connect our communities across time and space, 
and hindering the health and economic resilience of the people who carry and value these art forms, which in the United States are often people of color. Tradition, in fact, is an ongoing process of movement, growth, and transformation. And in a generative dance between the old and the new, there are some things that change and some things that always stay the same. The knowledge and spirit of our ancestors, the magic and power of the divine, incarnate and reincarnate in each of our gestures and bodies differently, much like how the taste of water is dependent on its vessel, the air and surroundings the vessel sits in, as well as a person's tongue and state of being. Tradition is timeless beauty and enduring freshness, a truth that survives the many fads of the many moments that have brought us to today. Tradition is shaped and forged by the visions of singular artists, even if we don't always remember their names. Tradition, however, is not the opposite of contemporary, a word we must also revalue. <laughs> contemporary does not mean innovative. It does not mean groundbreaking. It does not mean beautiful. It does not mean me meaningful. It does not mean purposeful. It does not mean universal. We must acknowledge that contemporary means with time. And we are all in, of, with, and between time. Furthermore, we must honor the truth that contemporary is more than white bodies, white aesthetics, and white power, which, by the way, which, by the way, can manifest in and as people of color, too. We need to recognize the intersected lineages to which all our lives and practices belong, and to pick but one moment in this line as an example, Ted Sean, dubbed the father of American modern dance, traveled the world over to research and observe the rich performance traditions of humanity. Speaking of Khmer classical dance, he wrote in the 1920s. Tagore cried in one of his poems, who can strain the blue from the sky? How can I then strain from the dances of ancient Khmer their adorable perfume, color and rhythm, and bring them home to America? And yet, while we never could duplicate or recreate this dance art exactly, it has many tangible principles which are universal in their application, and thus should be learned and used. If the dancing in any one country is truly great, it must have been founded on principles which are true everywhere. And thus the study of these principles is of value to every country. In the study of the dances of every nation and race of the world, I am never concerned with imitation, but with surprising the secret source of their charm and beauty that I, too, may tap that source and let the divine essence flow through me, perhaps in new forms, to the world. The question is then, in the lines and lineages of American dance, who and what did Ted Sean make possible? After living in Phnom Penh, a city in rapid building and transition, one exuding an organic chaos in the air, one where it feels that anything is possible. I've come to realize that our cultural institutions in America and around the world are too heavy. They move too slow. They are afraid of risk. Their connections to the surrounding communities are at times questionable or minimal at best. 
We validate ourselves at blue chip theaters, prestigious museums, and famous universities. But how often do our ideas leave the safety of their walls? We talk about creating vibrancy in our neighborhoods, but are our systems and institutions designed to move visions, voices, and dollars quickly enough to generate such a buzz in the air? From my experience, the people in positions of power are not moving fast enough. The problem is not their privilege. The problem is what is or is not done with it. Once in a certain island nation, I was sharing my work with a presenter from another island nation. Although she was excited about what I was doing and telling others to come see, I knew that she could never present my company and I because the government that funds her theater considers homosexuality a crime. Once in another country, I was pitching for a prize and one of the coaches tells me to de-emphasize the LGBTQ aspects of my work because she knows the audience and she wants to protect me. I tell her I cannot do this and explain the ethos of my company. She cries silently as I begin to reread my pitch. I also didn't win that night. And one time, one of many, I saw an American foundation call for proposals from LGBTQ advocacy groups in select countries in Southeast Asia, but not Cambodia, even though there's no one in the region or world doing what we're doing. We all have our visions, strategies, and approaches, our friends and cliques even. But how do we move forward on our journeys without letting others become missed opportunities? Do we serve our systems and institutions, or do we serve people? Are our theaters, our museums, our schools, and the people who create their narratives and their stories altruistic? On whose tears are their foundations built? Furthermore, what does systemic and institutional activism look like? Is our culture, our society, open and fluid enough for young artists to create and forge our own systems? Are we making room? Lately, I have lost a sense of confidence in the human powers that be. I tell myself that I must find a way to stand on my own feet because it's not healthy to wait for a curator or producer to come by. It's not healthy to survive off foundations or government agencies. Furthermore, I don't know that these people actively search for and seek out people like myself or that they even care. I wish that when I was younger, someone taught me about money because as someone who comes from the background that I come from, it's something that I'm having to play a game of catch up with in my adult life. I don't have a rich family. I come from one of the most economically and educationally disadvantaged communities in the United States. I never had the privilege to just dance in California. And now, thousands of miles away, in an, an environment lacking government support and human resources, I find myself trying to give this privilege to others. Beyond teaching and choreographing, and designing costumes, and directing, and managing, and writing emails, and mopping the floor. I am fundraising so that I can give my dancers a base salary of $200 per month. This is nothing by American standards, and nowhere near what I want to pay them. But it's enough for them to live on their own, and they have used it to support their families, 
pay for their college tuitions, and invest in their own small businesses. And because resources are few and far between in Cambodia, I have had to sharpen my own entrepreneurial capacities to be an ongoing rock and foundation for these young men, for the tradition that we love, for LGBTQ people, for Cambodia, for a better world. Happiness, success, and well-being looks different for each person. But in the case of my dancers and I, it's having the resources to live with pride, dignity, and independence so that we can create and perform this way. It's democratizing the field and culture of dance, creating a world where we are seen and heard and respected. It's being able to take care of the people and things we care for. I therefore encourage the artists in this room and beyond to really look at our relationships with money and business so that we can all be better masters of our practices and world. Nothing is more painful than having the vision without the power and resources for realization. And I don't know about you, but I've decided that I want to be the type of person that can make art, build schools, theaters and museums, create jobs and provide scholarships without having to ask for anyone's permission. It's a big dream and a lot of work. And in my ongoing endeavors for self-sustainability and growth, I'll admit that I am sometimes tired and devoid of hope. In moments where it seems that everything is falling apart, I have wanted to walk silent into, into the ocean at night, to leave nothing but the crashing of the waves in darkness. But I have never loved my life more. I am thankful for my friends and champions who have pulled me up when I have fallen, their kindness, generosity, and hope pushing me forward on this precious journey. I am thankful for the young men who have committed themselves to my vision and our tradition, standing beside me through thick and thin. I am thankful that I can dance and create on my own terms. Now I finally understand, in my blood and in my bones, how and why the artistic giants of old have often said, my first love is art. As we come together in these next few days, as our lives intertwine, I'd like to ask an important question. Why? Why are we the ones to be born the way we are in this moment in time? Why are we here? Why do we dance? As icebergs melt, forests disappear, and animals become extinct. As families and refugees cross dangerous lands and seas, as AI blurs the line between human and machine and the rich look to space colonization and immortality, as female, native, black, brown, LGBTQ, and differently abled bodies and lives are stripped of their agency, are shamed, harassed, policed, abused, and destroyed. Why do we dance? What is the efficacy of our gestures, the purpose, meaning, and value of our lives? Who are we living and dancing for? I imagine that the answers are rich and countless the lines of our lives and practices being of different colors, weights, materials, and sources. With honesty, vulnerability, and pride, I hope that we can all share our individual and collective journeys in this temporary home that we are creating. And may it be a safe space where we hold good hearts and intentions one where we trust and believe in the good nature of the others in the room and in the world, 
one where we, despite however difficult it is, possess the openness to listen, to hear, and to change. Now, change is dangerous. Art is dangerous. Beauty is dangerous. In the urgency of our conversations and interactions, there may be moments of discomfort and tension. But contemplate the idea of a mother giving birth. Contemplate a teething baby. Contemplate growing pains. Contemplate our popular saying, the truth hurts. Meditate on how the fire that burns has the power to both destroy and to transform. Can this moment be an opportunity for us to jump into a fire of purification, letting go of the things that hinder us, cooking and transforming that which holds potential so that we can elevate the state of art and humanity? What if, after jumping, we stood in, lived in, and danced in such a fire? What would our lives look like and mean? To push us forward, please allow me to offer the knowledge and wisdom of my ancestors, embodied by the dance tradition I carry in the search for our whys. In ancient days, Khmer classical dancers were offered to temples as living bridges between heaven and earth. They were known as Khnyom Prehrbam, or slaves of the circuit, sacred dance, which has its equivalent in the Sanskrit, Sanskrit terms Devadasi or Devadasa. Their dancing bodies carried the prayers of the people up to the gods, and the will of the, the deities was delivered back through them to the people and the land. Originating as a form of animist and ancestral worship, a prayer for rain and prosperity, the art took on more layers of meaning in its marriage to Hindu and Buddhist philosophies. In its union with the former path, it became a tool for social justice and morality. The Natya Shastra, an ancient Hindu treatise, describes how in a world of moral and social decay overrun by demons, the gods gave knowledge of the arts to human beings so that they may lead others to, toward spiritual transcendence. The first performance on earth is described as extremely contentious with demons obstructing the performance and threatening to kill the performers. Centuries ago then, according to the dawn of art, according to Hindu belief, our ancestors were already talking about censorship and speaking truth to power. In short, in the highest understandings of my tradition, the dancer is one who serves the triumph of good and the elevation of humanity, a force of social action and change. The dancer is vital to nothing less than life itself, a necessary agent in the movement and continuity of the cosmos. I fuse these powerful roles with the image of the bodhisattva, beings of infinite grace and unbreakable light who, although having the ability to reach nirvana, choose to be reborn in this world of suffering to inspire the enlightenment of all beings. In fact, in an ancient Buddhist text, dancers are described as householder bodhisattva. How can our gestures embody the radical and compassion of the bodhisattvas, beings who contain entire universes in their palms, who have fed themselves to starving tigers and jumped into fires for the sake of others? 
When we are selfless, who or what is allowed to dance? What does fe fearless love and liberating knowledge look like in the body? What are the images, the stories, the states of being that we are creating as individuals and as collectives? And how can our bodies, our thoughts, our speech, in both our dances on stage and in life, lead us to transcendence? To bring this down to the everyday, I'd like to share the words of an ancestor who lives in my blood and in my memories, and in his tooth I wear and hold sacred around my neck. My father lived for me, and through me he lived for my students, my tradition, and all that I care for. I don't think he knew that the gold chain to which his tooth once clung would someday be a lifeline for myself, for the future of the Khmer dance tradition, for the hopes and dreams of so many. My father tried to prevent me from being a dancer because he did not want me to live a life of struggle and poverty. He would go about in silent disappointment as I argued with my mother about my decision to dance, and I am unsure if they ever talked about her threat to disown me due to it. Years later, my self well gone past the point of no return. My father admitted to a journalist, when Brom was young, I wanted him to be a doctor, a teacher, or a lawyer. Now, as an artist, he is all of those things and more. For my father from the humble countryside, dance and art is healing and salvation. It is teaching, guidance, and illumination. It is the protection of justice, the triumph of morality. Dance is a life of service to the community. Dance is lifting humanity up. In Hindu and Buddhist thought, the pankaj, the lotus, is valued as a symbol of transcendence. It emerges from the darkness of the mud, rises through the murky depths of the water, to blossom in the freshness of the air and sun. All at once, it touches the four cosmic forces of earth, water, air, and fire. The lotus is transcendence then because it is connected to all of life. The lotus is the seat and throne of the divine, the stage and platform upon which the gods dance. In each hour of of our own ways, we are lotuses. And as someone born of the mud of society, I used to long so much for escape. I know now, however, that the mud is beautiful. It is rich. It gives life. I used to long for escape, for disconnection, but I know now that we are all rooted in this mud of life. I used to often long for escape, but now I dance for transcendence. What is the course of our journeys? Have we broken through the darkness or have we merely gotten comfortable, lost and stuck along the way? How do we restart and reimagine and reinvent on our ways up? And if and when we make it to the top, what divine idea, message, or being do you want to share and support? Or rather, are these things, like that golden drum 
beating in the sky, that which draws us to grow and surface in the first place. I hope that we can share the richness of our individual journeys as lotuses on the rise. Trace our journey down to our buried roots to find the ways that we are all woven together, full of powerful similarities, contrasts, and compliments. I hope that together we envision a future where all people are seen and heard and valued, one where our cracks and fractures are mended, one where making a space for oneself means making a space for everyone. I hope we can inspire each other with the energy, knowledge, bravery, and kindness needed to manifest this future. In this rapidly changing world, we bear a great responsibility to offer our fullest selves, offer the fullness of our bodies, hearts, and lives. Whose heroes will we be? How can we surprise the ancestors and visionaries who came before us while giving the children and masters of the future the needed strength, pride, and inspiration to pioneer new paths? Our lotus bodies crowned with enlightenment, our lotus lives the seat and stage of the divine. Let us be better homes and refuges Make this life, this sacred dance we have, matter for all. Thank you.